Paul, you know, the, the, our lung cancer colleagues are, I think, very used to doing liquid biopsies. Mm -hmm. It's one of their standards, even as primary diagnosis. Um, for um, molecular abnormalities. Good turnaround time. You don't have to wait on your pathologist. You don't ever get QNS. Uh, uh, if, if it's positive, you don't ever get QNS. Uh, what's your thought on, as a general oncologist, should they be doing liquid biopsies on our patients with pancreas so I, cancer? I would say it's even more challenging than doing the tumor biopsies mm. because we don't, unlike lung cancer, where we have well-identified mutations, you can select for those when you look in the blood we don't exactly know what we're looking for. So it's hard to know if we're missing it or if we're not, because we don't know what it is. I think in experimental settings, we do it all the time. But so far, we don't yet know if we're gonna capture enough information from the blood biopsy. Yeah, a positive one is very helpful. Right. A negative one doesn't absolutely rule it out, right? right. So you're then having to do tissue-based. So is everybody sort of tissue-based? Yeah, But Allison. I do choose to do a liquid biopsy on if I cannot get enough tissue. For Have you anything. been doing this? I have. I've been doing this. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's the second or third pass at a biopsy and you're still not getting right. it. Right, yeah. I you mean, know, could right. we just find a RAS and mutation and, and, and call honestly, it a day? it's sometimes the first question of the patient, why can't you just get it from my blood? Right. <laughs> well, they <laughs> seem to, you know, the newspaper tells them they can get it from their blood. Why, right. Why do you, we able do to you find I mean, there, it useful? Yeah, and, the thing is, it, it can be more challenging to find blood, you know, it just doesn't sometimes, if you just have a locally, you know, it just doesn't shed that much, so it's hard yeah, to find sure. that mutation. So in pancreatic, that's, that's a tougher one. Uh, so, and the other thing about coming back to where, you know, in germline where it makes sense, and I completely agree with Allison, is that you can really identify even without, uh, you know, the Olaparib data coming out, you can identify them for platinum therapy, frontline platinum therapy. So even for tr classic chemotherapy, you can choose to treat patients with classic chemotherapy on, based on germline data. Now, somatic is a little bit, again, is it actionable or not? What are the exact mutations? Because the BRCA can be, there can be different mutations that you pick up on somatic. And I think the data is much more muddy for somatic and be really, that's not in prime time right now. All right, we're sort of ivory tower <coughs> dwellers. And <laughs> so we say everybody should be tested. Are you not giving treatment, Ed, until you know the result? Or are you sending and treating? How are you, you know, so we were talking about platinum-based versus not? So that's the challenge, is the turnaround for, for what we treat, mm -hmm. we don't have time to wait. Mm -hmm. even. And so there is that appeal for liquid biopsy of shorter turnaround time. Right. You know, the, for using the information from a, the actual tumor tissue, um, to make decisions where I'm incorporating it right now is not as the very first step. Mm -hmm. So it is important, I think, to capture all these patients, but the, to get to the point about who do we test, when to test, which I think the goal is to test everyone to get that information at some point. But whether you can use that information before you start your first treatment for a metastatic patient, I think is still challenging. How, Allison, you know, I think you're really good in this space. How, how do we get the word out? How do we make sure that folks right. are, you know, the oncologists yeah. are ordering it and patients are aware? Right. I, it's been my goal to get the word out. <laughs> and I, uh, I think social media is such a powerful platform. Yeah. Uh, we use Twitter. Twitter is the biggest platform for the dissemination of medical data, and if anyone's on Twitter, you can, you know, share the data that's come out. That you know, all, all announcements about screening studies, announcements about stuff. The Generate Study just opened, and this is generate www.generatestudy.org. It's a large study sponsored by Stand Up to Cancer and the Luskarten Foundation where family members of someone who is known to carry a genetic mutation can get screened and then can find out more if, if they're at risk. Um, I have created Let's Win, which is an online platform to disseminate information about pancreatic cancer. And we have subjects each month, and, and one of our subjects is genetic testing. And we try to get the word out every month with information about why it's important to to check and yeah, I almost think it's easier on the on the patient caregiver's side because they've got one disease, right? And so they're going on PanCan, which is very right. effective. They're going on your website mm -hmm. and they're watching Twitter. So I think I've even already gotten an email from one of my patients because of the CNN report about sure. the, the new PARP uh, data. Mm -hmm. So, you know, they're they're fairly aware, but our oncology partners, you know, are getting, you know, 40 new drugs a year, new genes that need to be tested. Right. You know, what's the responsibility to now go back on your pancreas? Let's say your pancreas cancer patient is now in second line therapy and you didn't do it. Is, is that a patient I should now be sending down to genetics, uh, Paul, and getting tested, so I, catching up? 
I would say for the germline genetics, yes. Yeah. Because the best person to test is the patient. Yeah. And, and it both gives information about them and potentially for their disease treatment, but as we've talked about, for their families. You know, they, their, their family members will want to know if they have a mutation or not. Yeah, one of the things that I have always been a little envious of in breast cancer, one of the many things is that every HPI of a breast cancer patient begins, you know, 48-year-old, ERPR, HER2, right? And in our world in GI cancer, we still don't have that culture where that first line uh, is uh, this. And I think the more we do that, the more we teach our fellows, the more we share that information as we talk to each other, I think that comes forward. I mean, so, the guidelines yeah. have just changed. Yeah, just so I changed, think, right? I think that's going to have an impact in, in doing exactly what you said. The, yeah. the guidelines are a powerful group of experts saying everyone should be considered for genetic testing. But it is a lot. I mean, let's, let's spot our docs. Some, you know, sending somebody for germline testing is not just a tick box on the it's lab core sheet, right? You, you need to have genetic counselors often to support this. Right. And it's another uh, appointment for the patient when they're sick already. The patient, so. so I've worked with my genetic counselors to have the kits in my office so yeah. that they don't have to go. And we, we, we have our genetic counselors come over and meet with the patients. I encourage practices to do that, work together, because it makes it easier on everybody. Yeah. When we tweak the guidelines, we have to remember this does have some downstream, and is it really worth it? So is right. it worth it? What percent of patients <clears throat> are going to come back positive with something like this? So in, uh, in the germline data, it's about 5%, so more BRCA2 than BRCA1. So uh, when you look at different data, so let's say in the when they tested in the, uh, in the polo trial, it was about 7.5%, 5% got on trial, but really when you look at across different, it's kind of in the five to 10% range, maybe more towards 5% than towards 10%. So that's a germline BRCA1, BRCA2. Then the somatic is again about a two to 0.5%. And then you're getting into kind of the minutia of, like, like I said, the BRAF, the FGFRs, MSI is about 1%. When you get, get it together, it's about you know, 20, 25%. Now, the other thing what people, don't, you know, what, what I think we should get the information out there is when you look at the whole DDR subset, that's about 24%. However, it's not clear right now that does a PARP inhibitor really you know, help in an arid 1A, let's say, mutation or PAL-B2. That's still, that's still out to, you know, the jury's still out on that. So we really, our focus right now, BRCA1, BRCA2, we have data. ATM, we have some data that you may use a PARP inhibitor. But again, and we'll discuss the polo trial later, the polo trial also has been, uh, I've been less, enthusiastic about it than I was before, and I was really enthusiastic about it till yesterday, <laughs> and today, you know, when I kind You'll of opened around. my Twitter account and look, look, looked at it, it was, I, I was still happy, but I, I think my happiness quotient went down a couple of notches.